Likutei Sicha is Chelik Tezayin, Volume 16, the Sicha for Yud Shvat. This Sicha carries the Hayro'a, the directive for our generation, namely, that we have to seek to implement a Dira B'Tachtoinim, to bring down godliness down here in the lower parts of the world. And this is connected to Yud Shvat, which is the yard site, the anniversary of passing of the, free, of the previous Rebbe, as this is one of the main hoirois, one of the main directives and, and, so to speak, parting words from the previous Rebbe that he left us with prior to his passing. Now, in the several years leading up to the Friedrich Rebbe's passing, the Friedrich Rebbe, unfortunately, could not communicate well. And therefore, it was very hard for him, almost impossible, to deliver the Maimorim, the Hasidic discourses, which typically a Chabad Rebbe would deliver. And therefore, what he did was he wrote them out and they would have them published in advance of any given specific holiday or special occasion on which he, want, he would have otherwise deliver a Maimor. Prior to Shabbos, Parshas Boy, Yud Shvat, Tovshin Yud, which is Yud Shvat in 1950, which fell out on a Shabbos, which happened to be the yard site of his grandmother, Rebbe Rivka, which otherwise would have been an occasion for him to deliver a Hasidic discourse. The previous Rebbe had published a Mimer, a famous Mimer with the heading Bossi Ligani, which was distributed amongst Hasidim with the purpose and intent of them to study it over the course of that day and also future dates. Of course, after the fact, after what happened, that he had passed away, he was nostalgic on this day, it became very clear and obvious that this wasn't just any mimer, but this indeed was almost like a will and a testament. The marching orders for the Hasidim, what they should do preceding his departure from this physical world and how they should continue on. What is the main teachings and directives that he wants them to live with. So that, let's begin the Sikha. The Rebbe says that the yard site of a tzaddik constitutes the time that, quote, as the Alter Rebbe says in Tanya, all his work, all his accomplishments, and all his teachings, and all his avoid, the service of Hashem that he did his entire life, they come to, they become elevated and they culminate together and 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 get and get and go higher and higher up. In other words, they have their everlasting effect. Now this presents an optimal opportunity for us to dwell into, to think into, to analyze all his quote, all his deeds, all his accomplishments, all his teachings, and all his avoided that he did throughout his life in order to deduce from it, to derive from it a lesson for our day-to-day life with which we could follow quote in his footsteps. Now since every Jew in general has many, many aspects of accomplishments throughout the entire life, especially at Tzaddik. So sometimes it can actually, this can pose a challenge as to be able, being able to decipher exactly what it is that we need to focus on when it comes to his yard site. In other words, what should we exactly zoom in on, if I may, in order to, ha- take, to, to, ta- to have a takeaway from the yard site to say, this is it that we need to do. This is it that we need to improve on. This is what he wants us to accomplish. However, when it comes to the previous Rebbe, says the Rebbe, we haven't, uh, we don't have this challenge as much because he left us a mimer. He left us this discourse specifically for this day of his yard site, in which he li- he spells out, and he outlines very clearly what it is that he wants from us, what it is that he seeks for us to, so to speak, go forward with, and therefore we need to look into this mimer. So by by looking into this mimer, we'll certainly come to a very very good and obvious conclusion. So the Rebbe says at the very end of the Mimer, the Rebbe speaks very strongly, that is the previous Rebbe speaks very strongly about the idea, the concept of zrizos, of swiftness, agility, if I may, in the Avoida. Because he says there, quote, he quotes the Medrash, who is it that knows his time? Meaning, who is it that knows when his final hours will be, when his final days will be? Or as he quotes the Medrash, which the Medrash says that there isn't any person in the world that has the power to say, hey, give me a few more hours, give me a few more days, I uh, want to, you know, get everything in order and uh, talk to my family and, and say, say my goodbyes. 
No, when the time comes, the time comes. We have no control over it. And therefore, everybody, he says over there, has to do whatever it is they can. And as soon as they can, and as swiftly as they can, to try to accomplish as much as they can. So, Zirizus is, very, is the optimal thing. Zirizus is paramount, says the Rebbe. And not just in any in a specific detail of, of, of Avaida, but in the general Avaida that we need to have. What is the general Avaida we need to have? So for this, we look into the beginning of the Mimer, where clearly the Friedrich Rebbe, the previous Rebbe, states very, very emphatically that the whole purpose of everything is, as it's, he quotes the Medrash, that the Rebbe says, Nisava HaKadosh Baruch Hu Lius Lo Yisbarech Dir that Hashem, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Hashem himself had a taiva, he had a desire that they should, quote, be for him a dira, dira means a dwelling place, betachtoinim in the lower worlds. Now it's true that any time one does any act of Torah and mitzvahs, any whatsoever observance of, Torah, of mitzvahs or study of Torah, that is indeed another step, another point of accomplishing this. However, it's understood that this as a general directive or as a specific directive means that a per- this is very unique and specific that a person needs to focus. The main focus of a Jew in our days, that's what the Rebbe is writing to us, has to be in this specific thing. That means it has to be totally and absolutely with the objective of accomplishing this. This meaning to fulfill this desire, so to speak, of Hashem, that Hashem wanted to have for him, we'll soon see what that means, for him, a dwelling place down here in this world. And of course, this has to be parallel to what we saw, what we witnessed, or at least what we heard about, that the Friedrich Rebbe, the previous Rebbe did throughout his life. So the Rebbe says, in order to understand this better, we'll focus on the specifics of the language, of the expression of this saying of the Medrash. It says Hashem had the desire, and the Rebbe breaks it down. Number one, that it should be for him, for him, blessed be he. Number two, a dira, a dwelling place. And number three, specifically in the lower worlds. What does that mean? So the Rebbe explains it. When it says, number one, for him, blessed be he, that Hashem desired it should be for him, that means that this is for his essence, not for the various levels of emanations and revelations of godliness as they appear as they are in the world. Number two, it has to be in the manner of, in the form of a dira, a dwelling place, meaning it has to be something of permanence. It has to have a permanence air, an air of permanence that is. And number three, it has to be betachtoinim, it has to be specifically in the lower worlds, not in the upper worlds, not in the spiritual upper worlds, but the lowest worlds down here. These three things, says the Rebbe, actually, are tied in with one another, and they complement one one another. You see, because if you look at the various emanations and levels of godliness, since they are not, so to speak, entities exclusively on their own, rather they are expressions, various types of expressions at various levels of godliness, therefore... The only way for them to really be able to be realized and expressed is only when they have a kli, when they have, so to speak, a receptacle through which they can conduct, through which they could uh, emanate, through which they can properly shine. Therefore, they cannot, those godly levels cannot express themselves or contact with the tachtoinim, with the lowest, which are not, the lowest elements of this world, which are not a receptacle, so to speak, for that, for those levels. And therefore, and therefore, this does not apply to them, rather to his essence, his essence, which is absolutely and totally unlimited, infinite, and has no whatsoever barriers or limitations, his essence could, could um, come down in a very permanent manner, in any aspect that it desires, in any aspect that is, so to speak, invited to, and therefore, it can come down into the tachtoinim, into the lowest elements of things, and it can come down also in a permanent manner, like a dira, in a manner of a dira, which is a dwelling place, a place which you are permanently. So now, we see how they all three come together, and it's very specific. 
Now the Rebbe says, let's turn this around to the person who is seeking to implement this. The person who's doing it also has to have a harmony, so to speak, of these three things coming together. What is that? Number one, it has to be, quote, loy yizbarich. For him, for his, just for the sake of him, his essence of Hashem, which means it shouldn't be in any way However lofty for the person to, so to speak, have a spiritual experience, for the person, so to speak, to have a spiritual pleasure, which is a fantastic thing in itself. A person wants to be close to Hashem. A person wants to enjoy his closeness to Hashem. But the objective here in implementing this has to be solely, absolutely and exclusively for, quote, him, for the sake of doing what Hashem wants, for fulfilling his desire. And then number two, it has to be in a manner of permanence. It has to be consistent. It has to be continual. It has to be steady without interruption, without any wavering. And number three, it has to be betachtoinim. It has to come down, be'ikar, mainly in the lowest of things. And these three things, says the Rebbe once again, are all tied in with one another. They're not exclusive from one another, but in fact, they all come together and they all complement each other. Because if somebody is doing it, so, so let's say, for example, to satisfy his own spiritual desires, his own spiritual um, want, um, need to get close to Hashem, it, then it cannot be constant. It cannot be always, and it cannot be on a continuous a constant basis. Why? Because you can never, you never feel the same. Sometimes he has a greater desire. Sometimes he has a lower desire. Sometimes he feels closer to Hashem, and sometimes he doesn't feel as close. And also, a person can sometimes, you know, when it comes to the, if he, if, if he's doing it from his perspective, he sometimes he can feel like, well, this is a more important thing. This is a less important thing. This is a more loftier thing. This is a more lowly thing. However, when he's doing it exclusively because this is what Hashem wants, he's doing it lo yizbarech, then all three things come together. For It's lo yizbarech, it's exclusively for Hashem, it's not for his own needs, so to speak, his own spiritual, his own desires, albeit spiritual, but it's still his own. And therefore, it could be in a permanence, it's always constant, it's continuous, it's always the same, with the same dedication, and you reach the tachtoinim, you reach even the lowest elements because it's not about how you feel. It's about what the purpose is. And the purpose here is what Hashem wants, what Hashem wants to get out of it, so to speak. And he says, the Rebbe says, this type of approach was seen openly by the Friedrich Rebbe. The, the idea, the concept of Mesidus Nefesh, of total selflessness, total self-sacrifice, that he actually jeopardize his own well-being, his own safety, his own life. And he put his life on the line, he put it in danger, and this was a constant thing without any change, without any whatsoever alteration throughout all the years of his leadership. Which interestingly, there's another place where the Rebbe alludes to here, the Rebbe references another sikha where he describes the three periods of the Pridik Rebbe's Leadership. You have the first 10 years, the second 10 years, and then the latter 10 years, which he was here in the United States of America. But even though each one, so to speak, called for a different type of Mesidus Nefesh, or in certain specifics, a different type of approach, or a different type of Avoida, but in general, the Rebbe says, when you look at them, there was always the same selflessness, the same self-sacrifice, which went beyond any logic. There was no difference. There was no change in anything. And it was obvious and clear that the only objective of the Fidi Kareba was to do for, quote, for his sake, for the sake of Hashem. And, and there was, therefore, there was absolutely no change. It was constant. It was continuous. It was non-stop Mesidus Nefesh. Now, although his Mesidus Nefesh was in generally in spreading Toida and... Uh, and, 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 and making sure that everybody does mitzvahs and teaching chassidus. But we saw that the focus, the main focus, was in, three, it was in, the, next, in, in the following three things. Number one, to set up, to arrange uh, classes and instruction in order to um, um, train people, means those who are capable of it, to become rabbanim. To, lead, to become leaders of their communities, to be able to paskin halachas, just to know halacha lemaisa, that in all cities there should be a rav, there should be a leader who can actually direct the people how to keep Torah and mitzvahs. That was number one. Number two, 
His focus was on getting people to do actual mitzvahs, just to go out there and make sure that mitzvahs that a yid has to do are available and uh, every yid is able to accomplish it. Talking about, for example, setting up mikvahs, making sure that there is moyalim to, to do bris milas and so on. Just that mitzvahs maiseas should be accomplished all over. And number three, one of his main focuses was that to see to it that even little children learn Torah with these. We know that he sent out and many were arrested because of it and many had much trouble because of it. He sent out so many shluchim to set up chadarim, a cheder in which you learn aleph base with little children. This was his primary focus. These three things, he actually says the Rebbe, if you look at it, they're actually the quote, tachtoinim. This is, so to speak, the lowest element in the area of Torah and mitzvahs. And the, the explanation is as follows. You see, when you study Torah, there's so many different levels. Beginning with the loftiest level, as it's described in the Talmud, that there is actually a Talmudic seminary, so to speak, up there in the heaven, Mesifta de Rekiah. And all the way down to the way, the manner in which Torah is learned in many yeshivas and many koilim, that you learn in-depth study, analytical study, pilpulim, shaklavitaria. These are all fantastic things. But... This, this, this actually says the Rebbe is, is in a way, so to speak, a plague. Because if you really think about it, what, I'm sorry, not a plague. It's like a pleasure that really one has. This is really the element of Torah which brings pleasure. You know, it's the stimulation of the study of Torah in depth and then analyticals of, of, of the Talmud and so on and so forth, which true, it's fantastic, but then that is not the lowest point. The lowest point of study in Torah is the, le- the point where you actually derive the basic bottom line halacha that one needs to do, which sometimes might not be as exciting. But that is the focus, so to speak, that you see the lowest, we said the tachtoinim, the lowest element, so to speak, in the study of Torah. Now, likewise, when it comes to mitzvahs, also, again, as we're trying, we're trying to portray, we're trying to illustrate here how the previous Rebbe, his main focus was on the Tachtoinim. We already spoke about how it was Lois Barich, that it was exclusively for Hashem's per- sake, and that's why it was always Mesidus Nefesh. Mesidus Nefesh is something which is beyond logic, so it's beyond any whatsoever level, which beyond any whatsoever comprehension. So therefore it's for the essence of Hashem. And then we spoke about how it was continuous and constant, always the same level, the same type of mysterious nefesh. And now we're focused on explaining how the Tachtoinim plays out, the quote, the lower element, we explain how it is in Torah, now the Rebbe says how it is in mitzvahs. You see, in mitzvahs, again, you have different levels of observance of mitzvahs. Till, of course, the highest level is when one has the proper kavana, one has the understanding both from the halachic perspective and from the kabbalistic perspective, and so on and so forth. And then there is Pashit, simply speaking, the implementation, the actual observance of the mitzvah, even by a simple Jew, even by a little child who doesn't have the ability, doesn't have any whatsoever qualifications to be able to appreciate anything more than just doing the actual mitzvah. Sometimes you even have to walk them through, you have to almost like hold their hand and do the mitzvah with them, which is obviously the tachtoinim aspect of the doing of the mitzvahs. And especially when you think about it, learning with little children, learning with little children who have no whatsoever ability to understand any depth of anything. You literally learn with them by rote. You teach them alapes. Even when you teach them already a little chumish, a little, some verses in the Torah. Again, it's just literally repetition. It's really just going over things and saying it over and over again. Something which certainly for a great scholar um, uh, brings out absolutely no pleasure, no excitement. This is tachtoinim. Or when you learn with a simple Jew, when you teach him how to do a mitzvah, and he doesn't have the ability to appreciate the mitzvah. Once again, this is the tachtoinim in the mitzvah. Now, when a person is doing it, so to speak, for his own gain, albeit spiritual, then of course he seeks out to study, to engage with people who are capable of understanding, of getting a nice deep, in-depth shear, of, of learning at a higher level, or doing a mitzvah with an appreciation, what the mitzvah does, and the kavan of the mitzvah. But when... 
when you're doing it lo yizbarich, like the Fili Kerebbe did, and like he taught us to do, then you deal even with little children or with people who were very limited or like little children when it comes to knowledge and understanding of Torah. Says the Rebbe, the clear and direct lesson from this for nowadays is number one, there has to be a focus on learning halacha lemaisa. To learn Torah, not just to learn, you know, like they're learning yeshivas with all the pulpulim and so on, but the focus should be on learning and knowing halacha. That there should be people, those who are capable of it, there should be people who actually get trained in being able to paskin halacha. Because the truth is that the, the Rebbe says nowadays we see such a great increase in the study of Torah, but unfortunately there are so many who study a lot of Torah, but when it comes to practical halachas, they don't know the halacha. And worse over, that sometimes what could happen is per people who do have a basic understanding in how to learn, but they were never trained in how to pass in halacha, or they don't have the right people to ask uh, what is the correct halacha, they will open a safer on their own. And they'll open a book and look inside, look inside a Kitzvah Shechon Aruch, and based on their understanding, which may be very incorrect, they will come to a conclusion and sometimes do opposite the halacha. And therefore the Rebbe encourages that those who are capable should certainly seek out to become moirei hara, which means to become actual rabbanim who are capable, who are able to paskin, to paskin shailos, to paskin halacha. Number two, another directive is in the area of chinuch, of education. And the Rebbe says it's true that because of the laws in many, in many countries, especially the countries we live in, yes, there is a, a, a requirement to teach the children secular studies. And the Rebbe says this is a Dover Mavil. This is a scary, unbelievable thing that not one day should pass that a Yiddish child, regardless of age, whether five years old or 13 years old, must study secular studies. And the Rebbe says for this we need to have a serious nefesh, that there should be institutions, al Tadus HaKadosh. Tadus HaKadosh means on the most purest and holiest um, 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 manner. That there should not be any deviation whatsoever from the style of Chinuch that was for so many generations amongst Yidin, and especially considering in our countries that there isn't a Sakana, there isn't an inherent danger involved. No one is going to put us into jail or send us to a gulag somewhere. And the Rebbe says even those that for whatever reason cannot withstand, so to speak, this challenge. And they feel like they have to have, they have to follow the law, especially considering Dina the Machus Dina, the law of the land is law, as the Talmud says, and therefore there has to be in their institutions, they, ha- they do have to have a course of secular studies, but says the Rebbe, at least you can adapt this general idea of not you know, I'm not um, caving in and not compromising uh, the Yiddish education like the Friedrich Rebbe was so adamant about by at least minimizing somewhat the um, quantity and quality of the secular studies. That at least it shouldn't be parallel, it shouldn't be on the same level, at the same pace, so to speak, as the Limudei Kodesh. That means, in simple words, the Limudei Kodesh, the Torah education that's in the school should definitely outweigh both in quantity and in quality, both in time and in quality, the the, the uh, secular studies that are studied in the school. And this, of course, in addition to the obvious facts, says the Rebbe, that the day should not begin with secular studies, that a Yiddish child, his day, her day, should begin with Torah study. That should be the first thing. The first thing that a child comes to school, they should do with Torah study. And then, of course... Um, to see to it, to go out there and have, you know, as many Yidin as possible, even Jews that don't really know so much about Yiddishkeit, that don't know so much and don't have an, an appreciation and, and understanding of Yiddishkeit, that they too should also do as many mitzvahs as possible. And the Rebbe concludes and says, this is definitely possible to implement with ease, especially considering that when the Friedrich Kerebbe did it, there was no visible forecast, there was no visible... Um, uh, 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 so to speak, no visible possibility of success in sight. When in his days, everything seemed to be so doomed when it comes to Torah and Mitzvahs, and yet he fought and he continued and he continued trailblazing, and by the end we see the results. The Rebbe says if you go today and you find any, some, any descendant of those people who lived back then in the Soviet Union, 
in the most they went through the most difficult of times. And today they're keeping Torah and mitzvahs, and you ask them, how is this possible? Always you'll get the same response that they are the children of those who studied by the shluchim of the previous Rebbe when it was in a time when it was almost practic not only practically, but absolutely impossible to see and to expect any results. And yet the results are there. So how much more so in our days where there is no danger and the results certainly when one puts in even a minimal effort, the results are sure to come. One should definitely give themselves over to all these things.